Okay, I think uh, I think we're rolling here. I guess if there's any issues, somebody just give me a heads up if you can't hear me or can't see the slides. But uh, for the, those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Blake Weatherald. I'm the regional sales manager uh, for Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Been with uh, Alpine for 10 years now. Eight of those years as a district sales manager in Northwest Saskatchewan. And then the last two years, uh, I took over the regional role for Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Um, having a little trouble. My slides don't want to progress here. <laughs> there we go. Little history about Alpine, the brand. Uh, we are a manufacturer of liquid fertilizer products. So everything I talk about today is going to be related to liquid fertility. We also supply the fertilizer kits that are used to apply the starter nutrition. Company itself, uh, the Alpine brand has been around for over 47 years and the Nature's brand, which is our, our American counterpart, is, uh, is over 70 years. So we're talking about a company that's been doing this for a long time. We have developed new products over the years, but we have been around for a long time. We are the largest hot mix liquid company in North America. What I mean when I say that is we, we take acids and bases, we react them. When that happens, you, you get heat from the reaction. So that's where the hot mix comes from. This is our production facility in Belle Plaine, Saskatchewan. So this is where all the products are made for the Western Canadian market, as well as some of the Northern states. We are currently going uh, through an expansion process there right now to add a couple more reactors at the plant, as well as a larger warehouse for bottling micronutrients and doing totes as well. So some pretty exciting times there. So the topic of discussion today is going to be maximizing fertility and seeding efficiencies. We're going to talk about how we can get the most out of every dollar spent uh, and the most of the equipment we're using, as well as get the most out of each pound of fertilizer that we're applying. So I'd like to kind of start it with this. You know, I say think outside the box. Now, not anything I talk about today is going to be that extremely outside of the box, but if there's anything you can take home from this where you can say, you know, this is an approach I can use on my operation. Um, just keep an open mind that what we talk about today, while it may not be uh, completely used by all your neighbors, I mean, that's okay. It's okay to be the first guy to, to try some of these things. A lot of these things we're talking about today, there's a lot of research on them. They're very proven. So, so don't be afraid to, to think outside the box a little bit. So this is the overview. We're gonna talk about balanced nutrition, which you heard about this morning from Elston. So I'll kind of buzz through some of that. We'll begin with the starter nutrition, uh, focusing on phosphorus as well as a little bit on potassium. Then we'll get into foliar nutrition and we'll talk about our new potassium k -Tech technology. And then we'll kind of talk about what role CLS plays in all of this. When we talk about the balanced approach, this is Leibig's law. Um, I'm sure you've seen this before, but essentially what we're talking about is whatever is your limiting factor is gonna determine your yield, right? So this past year, um, in certain areas, moisture in terms of lack of moisture was an issue early on, but there's some things we can do to mitigate that uh, somewhat. I mean, if we get into extreme drought conditions, there's only so much you can do, but there are some things we can do with nutrition to drive yield, even when you have some of these stress factors. And I'll talk about that when we get into, into the talk here a little bit more. Uh, I do find a lot of guys get a little bit too focused on N as the driver for um, yield. I know it is very important, obviously, but uh, there, there is a bit of a misunderstanding out there that uh, if I just pile more nitrogen on my crop, that's how I'm going to build yield. When in reality, a lot of those dollars likely could be spent on, on different nutrients. We heard about boron and sulfur this morning. Uh, those are big ones. Uh, I'm going to talk about phosphorus and potassium today mostly. So just something to keep in mind. Nitrogen is not the only thing to look at when we're talking about building yield. Boulder's chart, you guys saw this this morning as well. Uh, the two nutrients I want to focus on today are going to be phosphorus and potassium. As you can see here, there's a lot of antagonism with other minerals in the soil when you talk about those two, two nutrients. So we're going to talk about how we can address that with some of the things that we're doing. When we talk about balance, this just shows that whole approach of, of as you add, in this case, phosphorus and potassium and sulfur to the nitrogen, we can build yield. So this isn't something new. We know we need NPK and S. 
Um, this just shows how on this particular case, they're able to build that yield as they add those nutrients. So that's all we're talking about when we're talking about balance. So we talk about getting the most out of your nutrients. We want to talk about are the nutrients available so we're in the, the correct form that the plant can use? Are they in the correct, uh, correct quantity? So are we using the correct rates? Are they available when the crop needs them all? So application timing comes into play. And are they accessible for the crop? So where are we placing these nutrients? And that's important when you talk about especially phosphorus, right? So we do this a few different ways. We look at starter nutrition to address some of this, and then we'll go out and we'll look at foliar nutrition and, and how we can utilize the foliar to kind of drive that base fertility program. This is the concept we're looking at. This would be kind of an extreme, but um, you know, this is the idea. You, you get that soil test early on, which is very important, especially when we're talking about different um, nutrients like micronutrients. What can we address in the starter program, which be, would be the inferral, which in our case is gonna be the Alpine G22 and HKW products. So we look at that and we use that Alpine G22 or the HKW or a combination of the two. And we say, what other nutrients can we carry in that based on the soil test? Then ideally you could go out there after crop emergence, say one to two leaf stage, uh, possibly, or any time before you go out there and apply a herbicide, pull your tissue test, have a look, see how you did with the starter nutrition up front and look at what nutrient, not necessarily deficiencies at this stage, but what nutrients are maybe uh, borderline, um, not quite low, but sufficient and, and address some of those when you're gonna go out there anyway with, with the sprayer, why not address any of these nutrient potential nutrient deficiencies if you're going across the field anyway. You're, you're spending that, that money on the application. Chances are there's something that that crop could use. Then you have the option to, to, to tissue test again and look at what we can address when we go from the vegetative stage of the crop into the reproductive stage. There's a big draw on nutrients and we'll talk about that, especially when we get into potassium. So it all starts with phosphorus. We know that phosphorus is very important for all these things, um, root development, nucleic acids, proteins, enzymes, all these things. The big thing I talk about when I talk about phosphorus is, is just energy in general, energy in that plant, driving energy in that plant. It's very important in ATP. Um, so whenever I talk about phosphorus, I focus a lot on driving energy in that plant. So the factors that affect phosphorus availability in the soil. Uh, we know that pH has a big effect on this because as you get into higher pH soils, you get, if you look on the right side of this picture, you get a lot of tie up from, from calcium, magnesium, those types of things. On a lower pH soil, so we'll call it seven and lower, six, five and lower, um, calcium, or sorry, aluminum and iron phosphates become the issue. So when you get your soil test, they're testing for that solution phosphorus, which is what is readily available as well as what will potentially be uh, released from some of these less tightly bound um, phosphates in the soil. So when a lot of guys get that soil test back, they look and they go, oh my God, I have no phosphorus in my soil, right? We see a lot of um, people or a lot of growers with very low uh, single digit PPM FOSS levels in the soil. Obviously this is a concern, but it's important to keep in mind that that does not mean that is the total amount of phosphorus in your soil. That is something to keep in mind that there is, there's a big bank of phosphorus in that soil that will get released over time. That does not mean that you can skimp on applications. You still need to address what the crop needs because a lot of this release will happen slowly. When you look on the left-hand side, some of this release is tied to um, the living biology in the soil and how quickly that mineralization will happen. There also gets to be some tie-up from some of this, this uh, which is called immobilization. And when we talk about how temperature affects the availability, as you decrease that temperature, which is what we're, we're doing when we're seeding into cold soils in the spring, acres are getting larger, guys are trying to get more done, we're seeding into some pretty cold soils. So that availability of phosphorus is very low. When you drop from 21 degrees C to 13 degrees C, you get a reduction of about 70% in the phosphorus availability. So that's obviously very important to think about. 
Now, when we talk about the form that's used, uh, the form we apply, we know that plants absorb uh, orthophosphate ions. That's the only way it's taken in. That's, that's just science. A polyphosphate must go through conversion, which takes uh, temperature and moisture to happen. Okay, so it's not available until it goes through that conversion. Now, when we talk about form and quality, you can look at something like this. So these are obviously two tomatoes. One obviously is a higher quality of the, than the other. We have different forms. You have a solid form of that versus a liquid form, right? That's going to affect availability. And then you have the quality of that liquid source in our case, right? So you have, uh, same with water. If, if I was to choose which glass of water I'm going to drink, I personally would choose the one on the left. There's obviously a quality difference between these two, right? So it's no different than with fertility. So this is a picture I got from one of my colleagues out of the States. Um, all of these liquid fertilizer products in this picture have the exact same NPK analysis. I think it's very important when you look at that, it's, it's very obvious that there is differences in the qualities of these products. So just because someone is selling a liquid starter that has the same analysis, that does not mean that that product is created equally. Um, there's a number of different ways you can make an analysis with a number of different raw materials. So in our case, quality is extremely important. We're putting this product through a very small orifice. So cleanliness of the product is very important. And when it comes to the agronomic side of things, we want a product that is very available and very seed safe. So low salt, high orthophosphate, that's what we're talking about. So our starters in terms of uh, the composition of our products, the starter products, primarily the Alpine G22 and the HKW18, gonna be a complete blend of nitrogen orthophosphate and potassium. So we're 70% orthophosphate, 30% poly. A couple of reasons for that. The poly helps keep the micronutrients in solution. We do actually add micronutrients to the product as well. And it will help with blending with other nutrients. So that's important. Low in salt content, which is important when we're talking about seed placement. Neutral pH, non-corrosive, which is different from your uh, liquid nitrogen sources. A lot of guys get the impression that if they go to liquid fertilizer in general, there's going to be corrosion issues with equipment, not the case with Alpine. We talk about forms, so we're talking a liquid versus a dry, so we're talking two forms of orthophosphate, just liquid versus dry. I like to show this one. I know it's Eastern Canada data, but, but there's 524 replications here um, of a response over 1152, so we're talking liquid versus dry. When we talk about two different forms of liquid, so we're talking about a high poly product, which is 10340 versus a 6246 in this case, case, which is the high ortho product for Eastern Canada. 230 replications, 5.2 bushel response, a little bit more local data. Um, this was done in Manitoba last year. Again, you got five gallons of the 1034 versus five gallons of the G22. You're talking about a product that is 34% phosphate versus 22%. So you're actually applying more phosphate in, in the case of the 1034, but you're actually getting a better response to the lower amount of phosphorus in the G22. Now, a couple of reasons for this. One is because we are in, in the form that the plant can use. Two is likely because of the salt index. Um, when, you, when you put salt in the seed row and all fertilizers are salt, including alpine, as you increase that salt index, you have the ability and the potential to decrease yield because of seedling injury, right? So the point I'm trying to drive home here is source does matter. The Alpine Starter Nutrition, what we like to do is we like to concentrate on uh, putting that phosphorus in the seed row and getting the rest of those nutrients out of the seed row if possible. There, there really is no need to overload that seed, seed row with high salt fertilizers, if at all possible. We like to focus on a good quality starter in furrow, add your additional NPKS sideband, mid row band. Um, in the case of something like Biosol, you're putting on, you know, floating it on. All good options. I like to remove as much of that fertilizer of the seed row as possible. This is what the placement is gonna look like. Um, <clears throat> So what you're getting is you're getting a, a very good band in the seed row, okay? 
um, which is important when you're talking about blending different products. And I'll get into that when we talk about micronutrient addition here shortly. When we talk about placement of phosphorus, so both of these, both the left and the right side, both had 58 pounds of 1152, uh, which is monoammonium phosphate banded at the time of seeding. The only difference here is the placement of the 13 and a half liters or three imperial gallons of G22 in the seed drill. So there's a few equipment manufacturers that claim um, placement doesn't matter, that the side band is close enough. I would argue when you see something like this, obviously there's an importance to seed placing that good starter. Oops. So this is what we're after. We're after driving root growth. I talked about how important that is. This is the G22 versus granular. How we do that is, is we actually get involved in how you place that product in the seed row as well. So we are very involved in the equipment. However, we can do that. Um, any type of opener, any type of planter, chances are we've set that up before. So we are dribbling the G22 right in the seed row, either before or after the seed. That's what we want. The application equipment itself, we are probably the only company really that gets very involved in this in terms of servicing the equipment, making sure guys are set up properly to apply the product. Uh, we pride ourselves on the fact that we don't just sell you a product and, and you figure out how to use it. We actually get very involved in helping the grower utilize that product appropriately. So we don't necessarily like selling the kits and equipment. In fact, in the spring, it's, it's our biggest pain in the ass, but it makes sure that the guys are using the product appropriately. Number of different options for tanks. Um, as you can see, saddle tanks on the left. The onboard system on the right there on the John Deere distro. Manifold system looks something like this. CLS is a very good uh, group there that you can work with in terms of, of getting set up with this equipment. They handle all the things that, that you see here and they are very, very good at servicing it as well. We also offer an equipment rebate program for new customers. So to help you with the cost of getting set up, the average drill kit is gonna cost um, approximately around $3,500 to $4,000, give or take, depending on the number of rows. Uh, smaller corn planters are gonna be slightly less, but that gives you an idea. So we'll actually pay back um, a portion of that through our equipment rebate program. And you can talk to CLS about how that works. So the other thing to keep in mind, once you get this kit on your uh, air drill or planter, is there other efficiencies that we can gain from doing this? Okay, there's other things we can add. Uh, we talked about micronutrients. You heard Elson talk about boron this morning. I'll get into that a little bit. Um, we also have zinc, manganese, copper, magnesium, um, EDTA chelates, which are important with high ortho, ortho product like the, the Alpine products because they will stay in solution, they will mix and they won't tie up in the soil. So very important. And you're gonna get superior efficiency compared to a dry micronutrient just based on the placement, right? You also have the, the ability because Alpine is a low salt product, biologicals are an option. We also have a number of customers mixing products like the Lignal Jewel um, in with the G22 to seed place it as well. And the nice part is CLS, because they have all of these products on hand, they can custom blend your starters or foliars to be able to do this. When we talk about the addition of something like boron, <clears throat> in this case, we're using a boric acid, which is a very uh, available form of boron. So we do have to be careful with applications rate, application rates. We did this trial intentionally over applying the boron on the right hand side. That is one actual pound of our liquid boron, which is more than we would ever actually apply because we know it's not safe. In this case, there was boron toxicity early on because of that. On the left hand side, we applied three quarters of a liter an acre, which is what we would have recommended based on the soil test of 0.5 ppm in this case. And basically what we wanted to show here is that the plot on the right hand side, that entire plot was set back. So obviously not what you wanna see, but what it did show was that we are getting boron into every one of those plants. With a granular product, typically you're gonna get a prill every 10, 20, 30 feet, depending on 
depending on what you're using in the application rates, right? So it just shows you the uh, superior efficiencies of, of using that liquid product. This is a picture of what it looks like. So the high rate on the left, low on the right, obviously some big differences in maturity. This is how yield turned out. Both did give us a response over the check, um, but as you can see here, the lower rate actually out yielded the higher rate. So for three bucks an acre worth of boron, three and a half bushels isn't bad on canola. Same thing here. This is actually a different trial we did in, the, in a similar area. Um, this was the tissue test we pulled. Just to show that we are actually getting boron into the plant, so we have a number of different um, applications here. The only difference in some of them is that boron. And as you can see with those red circles, the one on the left, second down from the top, um, that was the only one that showed sufficient amount of boron. Okay, And the only difference there was we added that half a liter. Now when we talk about the addition of other things like inoculants, um, with soybeans, for example, you can actually take the liquid inoculant, blend it directly in the tank uh, with the G22 product, good for uh, about eight hours. So very convenient um, as your second source of inoculant versus a granular that may cause issues in terms of bridging. Tie up a tank on your drill. Um, you know, this is something guys have found to be very convenient, very cost effective. For the pea and lentil growers, we've gone to this injection kit because the, the strains are not quite as hardy, so we don't want them mixed directly into the tank. So what we do is we run them through this injection kit so they're mixed for a very short period of time. Um, and it is the, the rate changes as you increase your rate of uh, G22 or HKW or whatever starter, that will actually compensate and will keep the, the rate of your inoculum the same. Now getting into the stage foliar nutrition side of things, um, we talk about going through the field. If you're going through the field anyway with that sprayer, chances are there's some nutrition that you could use. Now when we're talking about foliar nutrition, there still is a little bit of a misconception out there with some people. Um, they feel that foliar nutrition is applying UAN through uh, a stream nozzle or dribble banding. That, that is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about foliar nutrition. I'm talking about applying the products directly on the leaf surface. That is what we want to do. Um, we, we do not get leaf burn when we do it that way. The products are formulated so that does not happen. And they can be applied with most herbicides and fungicides, um, especially the product like the HKW and G22, very flexible in terms of what you can apply it with. So how do these nutrients enter the plant? This is important when we talk about timing of, of application. So the plants absorb the elements into the leaves through the stomata and cuticle, um, typically very fast through, those sto through the stomata. So when we talk about application timing, it's important to, to think about this, um, similar with, with your herbicides and different things like that. You don't wanna go out there in the heat of the day or under extreme drought conditions. Um, a, there's potential there for leaf burn. And B, you're not gonna get a lot of those nutrients into that plant because that plant mm -hmm. is essentially shutting down uh, limiting, limiting that uh, intake through the stomata because it's closing that stomata to conserve moisture, right? So we want to apply ideally in the mornings and evenings um, when the temperature cools down. Humidity is good for keeping those nutrients in solution, which I'll we'll talk about here shortly. The advantages we get when we apply this foliar nutrition, we can correct or what I like to say is avoid nutrient deficiencies. We want to look at being proactive. We, we don't want to wait for a visual uh, nutrient deficiency before we go out there and try to address it. Ideally, we want to hit that before that deficiency happens so we can limit the yield drag from that deficiency. So once you've seen the deficient symptoms, deficiency symptoms visually, chances are you've already lost yield. So we want to address that before that happens. We can also stimulate root uptake by doing the foliar application, um, combat, combat stress for, uh, factors, which we'll talk about here shortly. And the, the big one that we've noticed, especially with potassium, is applying that nutrient when the crop needs it most. So when we talk about increased uh, root uptake, what we mean is, is that root is what they call sink organ. So, so that root, takes in sugars and, and how that happens is the sugars are driven from the above ground parts of the plant down into the root system. 
those roots release what is called exudates and those exudates feed the biology, which then essentially release nutrients, which feed the plant, right? So we use the foliar nutrition to supplement a base fertility package. This is not a replacement for a good upfront base fertility um, package. We're trying to get more out of what we've already put in that soil, right? So if we can drive these exudates and drive this root growth, we can actually better utilize the nutrients that we've already applied in the soil. When we talk about combating stress factors, uh, these could be biotic or abiotic stresses. Uh, the biotics would be your insects, diseases. Abiotic would be weather, essentially herbicide, those different things that can, can negatively impact yield. And there are some things we can do to address these issues and stress factors. Uh, we know we can drive that growth and energy production in the plant uh, to limit the loss from these stressors when you talk about something like a herbicide. When you go out there and you apply your herbicide, even on resistant plants, that herbicide needs to be metabolized by that plant. And if that plant is utilizing all its energy to do that, or there's a shortage on something like phosphorus or potassium or whatever, to help drive that um, metabolism of that herbicide, we're gonna, we're gonna cause some yield drag. So if you've ever seen uh, flashing on the plants, uh, that yellow flash, or, or in some cases with something like a glyphosate, you've actually seen the plant almost stalls out and, and seems to not grow for, for five, five days to a week. We're trying to keep that plant growing and drive photosynthesis to, to limit that yield drag that can happen from some of these stress factors. This is what it looks like. This is new root growth on oats. Uh, this is four days after spring with G22 and manganese in this case. Phosphorus is a big driver for us when we talk about um, foliar feeding. We know that uh, as we talked about earlier, phosphorus can be somewhat inefficient in the soil. Um, we talked about a few things we can do to address that, but but we can also use a foliar application to, to drive phosphorus in the plant as well. And, and this can be huge for dealing with those stress factors that I talked about, right? From a data standpoint, this is kind of what it looks like. These are some trials we've done over the years. This is just the G22 product um, foliar applied because it is a high ortho product. You can use it and it will get into the leaf. This is a canola foliar trial. Um, done at Olds College last year. Pretty good response to a couple liters of G22 in this case. A lot of guys are using a combination of G22 and HKW um, if you're looking for some potassium as well, but we're going get to get into uh, a new form of potassium that we're, we're kind of leaning to now. And that's just a summary of that same idea of foliar feeding or of phosphorus. So obviously a very important driver and, and very important when we're talking about uh, herbicide stress. Now I will touch on the, the potassium side of things, um, and that is our K-Tech technology. This is a, a patented technology through Nature's Alpine. When we talk about potassium, you heard a little bit about this this morning. Allison talked about um, the importance of potassium. It is the second most utilized nutrient um, by the plants. The good news is a lot of it does get returned um, to the soil the biomass of the plant, not as much as removed unless we're talking about something like uh, alpha alpha, <clears throat> or if you're baling your, baling your straw, you're going to be removing a lot of that, right? So we know that potassium is important for, for a number of different things. This is a list of them. Um, regulates that stomata opening and closing. Uh, also, you heard about how sulfur plays a role in that as well. So when we talk about ionic balance and drought stress, as well as standability, potassium is going to play a big part in that. When we look at standability and cell wall strength and stem strength in this case, you have a low potassium uh, plant on the left versus a high potassium plant on the right. As you can see there, that's gonna be very important when we talk about lodging. Um, you also have the larger, healthier vascular bundles in the plant on the right. That's important when we talk about moving nutrients within that plant, nutrients and water for that fact. No adequate potassium when we talk about um, stress factors such as drought. So the way this chart works is when you look at this, as you increase the level of, of potassium or the application of potassium on the left-hand side there, and then you get into more severe levels of drought stress, uh, those numbers under the low, mild, and severe, that is basically measuring the photosynthetic activity happening in that plant. 
So you can see when the potassium application is low and you get into a severe drought stress situation, which is the, the number two there, essentially there is very little photosynthetic activity happening. When you go to the application of six in this case, which would be the bottom one on the left, and the severe drought stress, that number becomes 28. So you're still getting photosynthesis happening. You're still getting that plant growing. So that's why it's important when we talk about moisture and drought stress and the importance of potassium is keeping that photosynthesis going. That is going to drive your yield. We also talk about the <clears throat> helping the utilization of other nutrients. Um, this ties into balance again. So as we add potassium to the nitrogen application, obviously we're going to drive yield, right? When we talk about different sources of potassium, a uh, number of different options out there. We're most familiar typically with the potassium chloride uh, granular product. There are a number of different liquid products as well, thiosulfates, uh, potassium uh, phosphates, different things like that. What we're going to talk about today is the potassium acetate technology. That would be our KTEC products, and I'll show you which products those are here shortly. Um, <clears throat> it is the most soluble form of potassium available, which is very important, especially when we talk about uh, the foliar feeding side of things. Non-corrosive and very low salt content and phytotoxicity. So very uh, seed safe and very safe as a foliar application in terms of leaf burn. The Alpine products that have the KTEC technology in them are going to be these three products here would be the K24, which is a 24% potassium product. K20S, which is a uh, potassium sulfur with some boron, calcium, and magnesium, manganese in there. And then you have the F18 Max, which is an NK NPK blend with some boron, copper, manganese, and zinc as well. A little bit of trial data on this. So this is... Um, this is just sw switching out that 17% potassium um, to a KTEC form. Um, pretty good response there. This particular case, this was on corn. One of the reasons for that is the absorption and the, the availability of this product. So when you talk about uh, the molecular weight and the composition of this product and the solubility, this becomes very important when we talk about the foliar side of things. So if you look at that KTEC bottle there, you can dissolve that much potassium acetate in that much water on the left-hand side. So this is just a visual showing you how much more soluble this product is versus the rest of the uh, potassium sources out there. Why is that important? Well, it's very important, especially on the foliar feeding side of things. Um, <clears throat> the word deliquescence essentially just relates to the relative humidity um, required to keep that nutrient in solution. So when you see the potassium acetate there, the lower number is better because what that means is that uh, around 23% relative humidity, we can keep that nutrient in solution on the leaf, which is important so that that plant can absorb that nutrient and be better utilized. You get into something like potassium sulfate, very insoluble product, um, not a very good source as a foliar product. There's issues with leaf burn when you when you have a, a product like that that is going to essentially dry onto the leaf surface and cause that leaf burn. So that's where the smaller molecule is going to get into that plant a little bit quicker. This shows that here with the absorption rate um, through soybeans. As you can see, the acetate on the left, very high uh, absorption rate. Now when you talk about driving yield by applying the nutrient at the appropriate time, when you go from vegetative to reproductive stage, and this is for uh, all plants that we're going to talk about, there's a very large, large drawn potassium um, to form that seed. So you may have a lot in the soil or think you have enough in the soil. That does not mean that the plant is able to take that product up fast enough or take that nutrient up fast enough. So if we can hit it, and we've had a lot of success with this, with pulse crops in Western Canada is hitting it at that early flower as we're going through that reproductive stage in driving yield and driving seedling seed development. Same with uh, any cereal, it's gonna look like this, right? You get a big draw mm -hmm. on, that, on that nutrient um, when you go from vegetative to reproductive. This would be canola, no difference there, right? A, a big draw at that time. 
So it's a great time to go out there and apply if we're going out with a fungicide anyway, or as a separate application, you don't have to go with a fungicide. Some guys think, well, I have to have something else in there. You can just go with nutrition, um, but the majority of it is likely mixed with a, a crop protection product and there are no issues mixing there too, so. Blake, just so you know, there's three minutes left. Hey, perfect, I'm just about done here. Um, we'll rip through some data here on this. So this is the F18 Max product. 76% um, of the time we, we got a yield bump, average of 4.9 bushels. This is the potato data from this past year. So this uh, past two years, actually, this is two, two applications of the K24 product uh, and one application of the F18 Max. Pretty good response to potatoes. It, it has been a big driver as potatoes are a huge user of potassium. This is on wheat. Um, I wouldn't necessarily guarantee 11.4 bushel response, but this is what we got last year on this particular trial. This was the, the third party old data, the G22 and K20S mix. Canola, same thing as we had that K Tech technology, we are boosting that yield. So that's kind of all I have for the K-Tech side of things. I think um, I have a couple more slides here. I'll buzz through quickly. So how CLS can help. Um, they have all of these Alpine products on hand, which is very convenient in terms of mis mixing, doing your custom uh, foliar and, and starter blends. Um, outstanding staff in terms of service and logistics uh, really can't be beat that way when it comes to, to that side of things too. So they can, they can really help drive that program. Um, we're not into a lot of products that have a whole bunch of different nutrients in them. We're into kind of trying to address the needs of that crop or that field. So in the case of CLS, they can do that by, by custom blending these products if, if needed. So I think that's pretty much all I had. Oh, I'll just talk about um, any of the research, a lot of the stuff that we do ourselves. This is kind of our plot program, looks something like this. We do field scale research. We also do uh, some third party stuff as well as you, as you saw with the Olds College, but we do field evaluate all our stuff as well. Just in time. Perfect. Uh, Thanks. Time for Blake. Questions, but if we do, go ahead. Uh, we got less than a minute. So if anybody has any questions, you can either reach out to us at Carlisle Liquid Starters or feel free to get a hold of Blake. I'm sure Blake has no problem answering any questions. Absolutely. So we'd like to thank you for your time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks, guys.